let me say that I mean, fairly, fairly. I mean, it will not be really fair to judge a government in just one year. Mm -hmm. But it is what they have said mm. that is making it difficult. Because you say, oh, in 2017, we'll do 50 districts. Uh, we'll do one million per constituency. We'll, do, we'll start the one district, one factory. Mm. Uh, and at the end of the year, you are not coming to tell us, I'm going to start. I mean, it, it, it looks funny because it's like, when you took over, what were you expecting? You were expecting that everything was going to be rosy? I mean, when you sat, you should have known clearly that you set targets that are achievable so that you try to achieve something very meaningful. I mean, you can pick something very small in the first year so that mm -hmm. as you warm up, you know exactly that these ones are achievable. But unfortunately, it's like, so you know how we term it? Tell me. A state of promises. <laughs> do, was, do you think he's still, of ambitious? He was still making promises. Maybe probably because the president mm. has been in opposition and campaigning <laughs> as presidential candidate for eight years. So he forgets that he's no longer presidential candidate. Now he's president. So would, would you would you be surprised if anybody in the minority enjoyed the state of the nation address and probably was impressed with the delivery? Well, I'll be surprised. Because, I mean, you see, in opposition, your, your, your responsibility, I mean, core responsibility is to hold government to tax mm. on the things that they have promised, mm. on the things that they are doing. So mm. for you, sometimes yeah, it looks funny because it's like a, a cup, uh, quarter full or three quarters empty. You see, for, for those in government, even though it's just maybe 25 percent full they want to say there's something in it for an opposition you keep hammering it's 75 percent empty so, so from it, where you yeah. sit there'll never be a time that minority in parliament would ever be impressed with any of the state of the nation no no not necessarily i mean let me admit they've started free uh, free shs it's a good thing hmm. i mean there was no way i would have had education if it was uh, not under scholarship but maybe the way they are doing it is our worry because if you're not careful, you wake up and then they will just go into be like the situs that we have in our community where it is free, but everybody wants to take his or her child to a uh, private school. That's our worry because if you go around the secondary schools and you see the challenges in the dormitory, you see challenges uh, in the classroom, you see challenges in uh, the dining halls, you get worried. Yes, someone may call it that they are teaching they are teaching problems, mm. but for me, I did planning at the master's level. How did you plan it? So that mm. you are having these enormous challenges. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I heard you were a teacher at some point. Well, that was only national service. That was only national yeah, service. After A level. No, mm. sorry. And then there was one year strike at the university mm. when we were there in 1996. So one had to uh, teach, went, went back to be teaching in a private school. It wasn't something that you loved oh, no. and enjoyed. No, no, no. I mean, impacting knowledge is something that I really enjoy because you get the opportunity to shape the life of younger ones who are coming up. So mm. it was very interesting. But obviously, that was because of the strike. So yeah. when the strike was over, one had to go back to school. Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, so where did you grow up? I grew, I was born and bred in Ababo, in Kumasi. Right. Uh, from the airport runabout, from the airport, you get to the runabout. Just as you start climbing the Babu Hill, before you start climbing the Babu Hill, our family house is just on your right. So I was born and bred there. I grew up. I think almost all the 25 years of my life were there, even though you mm. go to school and come back and stuff like that. But basically, I spent all my childhood life in Ababu. And secondary school, where did you, you study? I did Tamil secondary school for okay. O level. Then I came to Technology mm. Secondary School for the C form, then mm -hmm. to KNUST to do my first degree. Back in to what? KNUST. My first degree was in Agric Economics. Oh, right. And then I went back to KNUST, but this time I did Development Policy and Planning. What, 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 was the, what was the plan? What were you heading? What did you want to be? Well, interestingly, by the time I went back to do the masters, I was already gainfully employed because I was uh, working with a cocoa buying firm, a license buying company. We call them LBCs. Okay. And uh, that was Igbapa Buyers Limited. And that was the second, that time, where the second largest buyers after PBC, the government owned, mm. were the second largest. So 
By the time I went back to do my master's, I was already gainful employed. And the hope was that I was going to use that to maybe to be able to move the the company to the next level because mm. I, I, I've gone through mm. the ranks. And by the time I finished my master's, I was the head of a research monitoring evaluation for the company. Wow. And I'm always proud to say that I introduced computer in the company and all the things that we're doing, we had to computerize them. Mm. That time it wasn't easy for you to give a pro someone to write a program that will meet the what you are doing. So my master's level, the study, my project work was on Coco. Mm. So we we computerize and I mean I can tell you that we saw the difference in doing team manual and then computerizing. You and sound like you had a privileged upbringing. What? <laughs> Did you? Maybe let me tell you, I, the first time I stepped in the classroom, I was almost 11. I almost missed school. The first time you stepped, stepped in, the in the classroom, classroom you were almost I 11? Was, oh, 11 years, yeah, because I almost missed school because I'm the 14th child of my father. The first 13 have not been to school. So in the family, I was the first to get the opportunity. And even mine was a real struggle. And my mother continued to be the biggest hero in my life. You were the 14th of how many children? 41. 41? Yeah, my father's children were 41. Yeah, the first wife had nine children. The second one had four. Mm. My mother is third wife. She has 12 of us. The fourth wife had three. She was divorced. Another came as fifth. She mm. has seven. Then he divorced the first one. Then he brought the seat in the seat <laughs> one she gave it to only one child mm -hmm. then the second original second one was divorced and he brought in the A seventh eighth, one the seventh one who gave it to also five children so if you put all together it's married total seven, seven wives and 41 children 21 <laughs> females 20 males he deserves a round of applause. <laughs> I wish he was alive to hear the crowd. <laughs> He's long dead and gone. He died some 20 years. So how, how was, and, and you all lived in the same house? Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, I don't know how he did it, but this was really a great man. Because with the greatest, I have two wives. You have two wives. I, I dare not put them in the same house. So what? Five, so five more to go. <laughs> who bone dog? <laughs> it's a whole industry, my brother. It's a whole industry. Yeah, it's a whole industry. <laughs> and we're living in the same house. The wife's room after the room. Everybody had their room. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the house had just ten rooms, but everybody had a room, and we are group. We were grouped into rooms okay. not only your mommy's children but that kind of mix you eat together okay I mean, one woman cook for everybody so the kids were mixed yeah. it's yeah, not like you were, lived we're, with we're your mixed. mother specifically we were really mixed why we're, why that my father had a philosophy that one he needed to find a way of making us grow together so that just by coming from different mothers we'll be each other's <clears> keeper and two I mean, you know, sometimes suspicion and mistrust of maybe one woman doing something to the children of the other. Okay. So he insisted that there was no way. If my father saw you in your mommy's room eating alone, that could be a license for divorce. Okay. Yeah. So it was very strict and he really worked hard. Mm. I mean, he, like I said, he himself didn't get Western education. So... He really worked hard to br to bring us together, and believe me, believe me, uh, if I I could just get forty children or forty one <laughs> children like he did, obviously I'll, 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 I'll be happy. But I don't know how I can get there because I have six now, and you I sound don't like you want to get there. No, I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Because by the time my father was my age, I think he had already crossed thirty. Wow. Yeah. So. 30 children so mm -hmm. I mean obviously I doubt whether the gallows or whatever effort I make whether I will even get to 10 but believe me the number is so helpful now because some are in the military some are lecturers some mm. are like some of us some are business some are abroad and what have you and believe me no problem is beyond the family mm. any problem that comes up we just call each other right and with it, people make so pledges. now you have like a, a big so, WhatsApp group yeah, or something. So, <laughs> yeah, we have almost every group have uh, a, a platform. 
Wow. So I had my sign because uh, I'm the first of my mother's 12 children. Mm -hmm. So I'll be called, then I'll just put it on our system. The one that normally is a S checker is the one who is a lecturer at KNUST. You call everybody, no, there's this problem, we need to fix it, mm -hmm. and it has to be fixed maybe in three days. What is your pledge? People make pledges, they transfer the money, and within a twink of an eye, you see the problem solved. Uh -huh. And I, I, my father never had even a vehicle. By the time my father died, my senior brother had a motorbike, and that mm -hmm. was what he used to carry our father to the mocks mm -hmm. on Friday mm -hmm. and activities. And sometimes when we have family meeting, we all decide that let's go to the family house to meet. Sometimes you just shed tears because we we'll, we'll just take the road in the whole area because almost everybody is driving. And sometimes I wish he could wake up to see yeah. the effort that he has put because not the number that matters, but how he has been able to make us to be each other's keeper. Okay. That's, that's really, mm. really very significant. I mean... It is impossible not to have some that have some behaviors that may not really fit well. But if you say generally, I would say that he has brought up children that are very calm. My sisters, every one of them is married. Because even the last one who completed KNUST last year is married. Mm. So all my sisters are married. The young guys, the males, we have only two that are... Sorry, my sisters, one... Is in the medical school who is finishing this year, so she's not married. Then only two other boys are not married. Okay, you have what six now? I have six. Now. You mentioned earlier that you dare not put your two wives in the same house. I can't imagine, maybe because you can afford to put them together uh, separately, but <laughs> I can't imagine putting no, but them if, together. If, if your mother uh, shared the same house with six other women, yeah, thereabouts. How are you unable to put maybe, them? Maybe, maybe, maybe because I can afford, so the women will make sure that they don't stay together. But maybe if I couldn't afford to put them separately, maybe they will force to stay together. So how do you, how do you rush? Do you have a, a timetable? Well, fortunately for me, the senior one is in Accra with me, and uh. the younger one is in Kumasi. So it makes oh, it a little okay. bit easy. So when I'm in Accra, <laughs> you fully are yours. If I'm Kumasi, fully hers. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Wow. So when you go to America. <laughs> oh, but interestingly, all my colleagues who are in Parliament will tell you, I, I, as part of me, I travel a lot with them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so sometimes intense. I mm -hmm. mean, when I'm going this time, I look at your itinerary and your, what you are doing. Mm -hmm. If you are free, we go together. Another time, if the other person. So sometimes when I know I will travel in March, so I'll start looking at the itineraries and see how mm. people can make room so that where it is possible we, uh, we always travel together most of the time my colleagues will tell you you see me with my, my, my one of them okay um, when we travel yeah all right <laughs> must be a hot being in his seat <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk about politics you entered uh, the political world in a very interesting way yep. um, of course sticking up the seat from uh, the man you were com campaign manager for. Yeah. Tell me the circumstances. Were you always a passionate uh, lover of politics or what? I, 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 let me say this. Mm -hmm. I believe in social service. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe in community service. Mm -hmm. And it manifests throughout my life. I mean, the area where we, are, we, we, we grew up, they will tell mm -hmm. you, when there's uh, the madrasa, like the uh, Arabic schools, mm -hmm. you know, they used to use these uh, uh, palm, palm, palm trees to cover it when it dries up. You see, my younger brothers and I voluntarily will go, because we are not far from the airport. That time, the whole of the airport, where DVLA today is, is just a uh, whole forest. We'll go, come and try to roof the place and stuff like that. and. Even whilst I was at the university, when K uh, NDC was formed, I think we were among the very first group that tried to be the team. Interestingly, because maybe my old man was a, a die die lover of for the former president, Jerry Rawlings. So you come to a house, always talking about CDR issues and PDC issues. But when I left school, 
and I was working are associated with my community. Mm. And sometimes when they have meetings, they will invite me. So I, I was even a branch executive. I move on to be mm. even at the constituency level. But I was not really very active until one of my friends in 1996, Dr. Uh, Musa Amin. After the NDC have gone for primaries and it produced one Dr. Golo, then my brothers in the Zongo gang up to say that they don't want him because this is a Muslim community. We need to put up a Muslim and what mm. have you. And the founder and others said that, okay, then let's look for someone. They called Dr. Golo to let go. But he also said that if he has to let go, he will not allow, with the greater respect, those middle school leavers and other things, they will have to find a graduate from the community for him to hand it over to other than that, he will stand. So they started looking around. Then my friend Musa Ahmed was called and he accepted and we campaigned together. He won the 1996 election and came to parliament in 1997, January. So in 2001, when the tsunami that brought uh, President Kufo came yeah. and NDC had to lose most of its seats, we also lost that seat. Okay. So the reorganization like we are doing today, mm -hmm. and unfortunately my friend left for America. And when he was going, it was like, oh, I'll come back. Mm. So those of us who were friends to him thought that, oh, we can be keeping around the yeah. constituency. So when he comes, it will not be too difficult. Okay. Unfortunately, he didn't come. So around that time, just as we were nearing the 2004 election, we had this very popular doctor because he provides he, he provides a lot of free services in the constituency. Dr. Jibril came that he was interested. So I said, ah, it makes it easier for all of us because we are looking for a credible person yeah. to to stand in for us. So <coughs> he came in and we started to support him. But that year, we did the primary very early. Mm. So along the line, he, he, he gas out. So because of the commitment and wanting to get, we take this seat back, I supported him heavily. That's how I became his campaign manager and mm. all that, and that he won. Unfortunately, he came to Parliament and did, I think, just 39 days, and he died. So when he died, who to replace him? Oh, I mean, Mubarak was so helpful. This is the time we are sure that when he comes, we don't have to spend much resources. Mm. And I was saying, no, let's look for another person I will support. You were not interested? I wasn't, truly. I, I just finished my master's. I was in a well-paid job. I was doing well in my company, and I thought that I needed to concentrate on that and to be able to help someone else. The Honorable Babi Nanko descended in Kumasi fish me out, got the then regional imam is so rest in peace, Malem Rana and others to talk to me. Along the line my mother even got annoyed with me that ah, who are you? I mean these big guys are all coming around begging and you are behaving as if you are the the most intelligent in this community. So I had to back out with the understanding that okay I will go but I'll do only one term. Okay. And it was accepted. I'm still serving the one term. <laughs> Yes, you're still serving the one term. And I know uh, the folks in MPP always joke around that you are a thorn in their flesh. Well, <laughs> You've heard that several, haven't you? Maybe let me say this, even though lightly. <clears throat> the president, anytime he meets me, he says, Montaga, why are you not letting go this seat for us? <laughs> then I'll tease by and say, that, Oh, I thought you'd be supporting me to keep it. To keep the So, like to today, for seat. those of you who were watching TV, when he got to me, he did this. Montaga. Two years, you will leave this house. I said, Your Excellency, I have two more terms. There you go. <laughs> so, I mean, we always crack this anytime. This Excellency, you know, I met him in Parliament yeah. when, when he was a member of Parliament. We had come as junior MP. So mm. anytime we meet, he cracks these jokes that you have to let go. This is so. Right? What makes what makes your constituents keep you there? Well, I think they will be best to answer this, but I think that is a commitment. Mm. You know, sometimes you are not able to solve all problems, but people see the sincerity and genuineness in the effort that you are making to make the constituency great. Mm. And I believe that largely that's what encourages my constituency to continue to vote for me. Since let me admit, yeah. let me admit, when I first came to parliament, mm. my constituency was the last in Kumasi in everything, mm. in everything. 
If you want to talk about rules, we are last. If you want to talk about good classroom board, we are last. If you want to, when I came, there are, they were called, even where my house is currently in Kuma, in my constituency, didn't have light. There are places that didn't have water. I mm. mean, or oh, a lot of challenges. The crime rate was excessively high. Or uh, what do you call the school dropout was just so high. Today, 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 I'm really humble to say. Any assessment that you do, maybe with the exception of crime rates, it has come down drastically, but we still have some level of crime rate. Obviously, you mm. understand because of the level of poverty. I understand. But if you are talking about infrastructure, I doubt any assessment, no matter okay. how you turn it. You know, you, you've had a very again. enviable political career. You've been mm. in Parliament since 2005. Yeah. But... Your time in politics has been laced with lots of issues, not, challenges, uh, allegations of all sorts, yeah. inquisitions here and there. Mm. Let's let's start off from uh, your days as Minister of Youth and yeah, Sports, so, uh, <laughs> the famous Pampas and yeah, Chichinga saga. Yeah, I remember some, yeah. one time you went back to Kumasi and the yeah. ladies met you with Chichinga. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are right. So, with the benefit of hindsight, what do you make of that situation now? Well, I, I just think mm. that our politics is a type that. People test through anything at you, hoping that some will stick. Mm. So you will have expected that after shred, I mean, but no any other person, but I mean, short, mm. cheering it, clearing me, you thought that could go. But obviously, you understand this. Once you're in this game, I always tell people, if you're ready to go into politics, mm. be ready for three basic things. I always say, name calling, mm -hmm. possible imprisonment, and maybe possibly die, dying. Wow, yeah. you're ready because, for all three. Yeah, well, Name if calling. If, if you are not ready for it, you cannot sincerely say it. Because so for anybody who wants to get into you, politics, this is what you tell them. I always tell you, you should be ready for it. Because name, call me, name calling is the easiest. And probably that's why a lot of women don't want to come into uh, the game, especially mm -hmm. in our part of the world. Name calling, I mean... Name calling, imprisonment one, or death. Yeah, you should be ready for any of them. It's, is so politics that dangerous? It is because see, someone said that the most expensive commodity God has created on earth is power. Mm. People think that is money. It's not true. That's why people will sell assets and what have you to be able to have power. Mm. So when you hold it and you have thousands every day praying that something nasty should happen so that you leave it so that they can also take it. So that generates a name calling. Have you had a near-death experience in your political career? Believe me, what happened in 2009 uh, almost sent me close to that. I mean, not like someone killing me, but even that, I think, because I remember that during that time at the office, sometimes you come and you can just see that someone has tempered with your fridge. So it came to a time that I was in eating in the office. Mm -hmm. because of fear. Well, you can't have any proof to be able to tell. If it were today, you could have mounted cameras to be able to observe what, what is there.